It's kind of interesting there that everybody's talking, and all of a sudden the preacher gets up and it gets real quiet, really quickly there. I thought Hinton was about to say, here, welcome John here this morning here, and I was getting a little scared that all of you are going to run up here on the stage at one time and, and rush me, but uh, it's good to be here at Beltline. Actually, this is probably one congregation in the state of Alabama I have not been to ever, except I've probably spent more time in your fellowship hall and youth room than I've ever been in your auditorium before. I've known Scott and Rachel for, uh, well, we were in college together, so uh, I won't say how long that was, um, for Rachel's sake, in here, and uh, for Scott, if Scott was here, no, nah, it would be, we'd be free game, but uh, known them for many years, and know that they have been up here, and, and loved them dearly, the singing was fantastic, I have known Hinton since he was a toddler, um, I remember going with his dad and picking him up from Alabama Christian Daycare right there in Montgomery, and it is true, he was the same size then as he is now, and uh, you know, not much has changed over the years. I figured I could give you some stories, and Brother Frank said I could, but um, y'all want to get out of here and go to lunch sometime, so we'll save that for, for later. Uh, I do want to thank the elders for giving me a chance to come and, and fill in for y'all this morning. I, I hope that uh, we get something out of this lesson of what we're going to talk about if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. This is kind of where we're going to start here this morning. It's kind of where we're going to put ourselves down. And while you're turning there, I wanted to ask you this question as we kind of begin. Why do you do what you do? All of us have some sort of motivating factors that, that encourage us to do certain things. Go to work. Why do you go to work? Well, I've got to pay my bills. Well, that's a motivating factor. I, need, I like to eat every day. That's a motivating factor. Why are you here for service at 8.15 in the morning? Well, some of your motivating factor is, I want my afternoon. That's okay. It's a good motivating factor. But all of us have some sort of things behind us that push us to do what we do and to live our lives the way we live our lives. Paul here, in Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to kind of start right here, beginning in verse 25. He says, therefore, having put away falsehood. When you've made that decision to become a Christian, you made this decision in life that you were going to put some things away. And he says, and he gives this whole list here. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbors, for we are members one of another. Pretty good, pretty good, nice way to start this section here of, of this text. But then he kind of jumps in head first. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good as for building up, as fit the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit." of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Wow, this is some tough stuff that Paul is hitting us with. He's not really wasting any time. He's hitting us straight between the eyes. This is one of these passages I like to term a be no passage. You know what a be no passage is? This is when the writer's coming down and says, there's going to be no more of this and there's going to be no more of that. And that is what he is nailing us here. And if you study the book of Ephesians, you kind of understand that the first half of the book is about what you believe and the second half of the book is how you behave. The first part of the book is kind of about doctrine. The second half is what you do. And so Paul is sitting here and he's coming down with both fists and saying, look, this is how you live. And you can't help but look back and say, wow, Lord, this is some tough stuff. This just, just these two paragraphs right here. I, I wish my kids would just do part of it. The anger, the malice. I wish that we could just do those two parts and I would be happy. And yet God has called us to live these lives in a bigger, in a, in, 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 in a, in a more holy way. This is one of these passages that I have when I have my little study Bible that I have back in my office back, back home in Montgomery that I like to write down YBH next to. You know what YBH stands for? It stands for yes, but how? You know those verses, right? Remember on the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, hey, if somebody strikes you on one side, turn and let him strike you on the other. Yes, Lord, but how? <laughs> 
Forgive others who do wrong to you. Ooh, yes, Lord, but how? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Yes, Lord, but how can I do that faithfully? And we all have these passages. We all have these things that we look at in here and that challenge us to move. And so we got to ask ourselves the question this morning, how do we answer these YBH questions? What will move us to do the thing that Paul asked us to do? Once again, I'm asking you, what motivates you to live your life as a Christian each day? What motivates you to live for God when you go out and you leave this building? Because let's be honest, inside this building, when you're at fellowships, when you're doing things with each other, it's very easy to live this life. It's very easy to say the things that we need to say. It's very easy to interact with other people. But when we go out to our jobs, or we go out to the ball field, or we go to our schools, or wherever we go throughout Decatur or North Alabama or wherever else you're going, that's when the challenge comes. So we're going to look at here this morning, we're going to try to answer this question, what motivates us? Because I'm afraid that for many years, duty, guilt, and fear were good tools that made us do it. Let's be honest, parents. How do we get our kids to do certain things? We put the fear of God in them, don't we? Yes, you do that. You know, the mom sits here, their kids act up. You wait till your daddy gets home. And they sit back in their room scared to death. When I was younger, I, I probably, you know, when I was a kid, I had a drug problem. I'm a recovering elders kid. I was drugged to church all my life. I mean, I was raised in a very conservative home. This is where, um, and I thank God for, for growing up how I grew up. I, I grew up, we never missed Sunday morning. You never missed Sunday night. You never missed Bible study. If, there was a, if you played ball, which I did, and it was Wednesday night, it didn't matter if you were in the middle of that game. When time came to go to church and you needed to leave, we were off the field, and we, I was heading over to the, to the church building. That's, that's the way I was raised. I love it. I still have it. That, 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 that training and that mindset has been in my my life, all of my life, and I try to put that into my kid's life. But I remember growing up that I would hear preachers and they would almost be angry when they're up there preaching with things and talking about people and talking about things. And you know what? It's really helped our brotherhood a lot, hasn't it? Oh, when we would preach and we would beat and we would anger, have anger toward people. But folks, you can't beat badness out of people. That's one thing I've learned. You can't beat badness out of people. Do you have to discipline people? Sure, absolutely you do. Do you have to discipline your kids? Absolutely you have to. But our fallen nature can't be changed by more fallen nature and piling, uh, piling upon it. So what is it? What is it that will grab me to hold, take hold of this truth? And it's right here in the passage where I left off. You see, remember, man is the one who put these chapter markings in here. And Paul is sitting here saying, don't be angry. Don't, don't take it to a point where you sin. Watch what you say. Watch how you do these things. Watch your bitterness. Watch all of this. And this is how you do it. Verse 1, chapter 5. I want you to be imitators of God. I'm supposed to imitate God? I'm supposed to do this? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What's he talking about? We just came together and we partook of the Lord's Supper. The song that we we sang leading up to, to, the, to the supper that we just had together, the, the words that were said, the prayers that were prayed, of taking our time and, and going back to Calvary, going back 2,000 years to sit back and watch grace appear. You see, folks, when we look back and we go back to Calvary, Paul is sitting here saying that the answer to changed hearts is not anger and duty and guilt, but Calvary. It's about God's grace, and when grace finally gets you, grace will get you to do things 
and live in ways that you wouldn't otherwise. You remember the Nike slogan, just do it, just do it. I'm afraid that that's kind of been our slogan for church. Righteousness, just do it, just do it, and everything will come into place. But here's the thing, once the message that Jesus has already done it gets a hold of you, then wonderful things are going to happen. Things are going to change, and you're going to start doing things in a different way. Now, here's the problem. If you're like me, and you were raised how I was raised, bred within us is, is, a, is a natural queasiness and suspicion about this whole grace gizmo. Okay, you understand it. There you go. I remember being a student at Faulkner, and you're sitting here, and you're studying to become a Bible major, to become a preacher, a youth minister, whatever. I remember even way back then, there were two subjects you didn't talk about. Grace and the Holy Spirit. That would get you written up in a brotherhood publication quicker than anything else. And so what did we do? We stayed away from it. And what have we done for the church for the last 60, 70 years? We've stayed away from it. And we left everybody outside of our buildings to talk about it, but we haven't talked about it. And here's the thing, Paul probably spent more time talking about those two subjects than he did anything else. Because I believe that Paul felt that if we could ever come to the place where we could proclaim grace powerfully, then people were going to work harder than ever before. The place where we're going to kind of part for the rest of this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So go ahead and flip over there, because that's where we're going to be part for the rest of the time here. I grew up and try to watch my time here. Don't worry, I will get you out on time. I grew up thinking of Paul as this one guy, this great guy, but then his former life as Saul, he was this mean guy because after all, he went through and he pulled people out of their homes. He threw them in the jail. He was ready to kill them because of these Christians, this Christian idea. But as I've grown up and I've had more study, you look at what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and he gives this whole autobiography about his life of how he's a Hebrew of Hebrews and he does all these things and when you get down to verse 6 and verse 7 he talks himself about I, I was a, a persecutor of the church but righteousness under the law I was blameless and I struggled with that how can Paul say that he was blameless when he's sitting here pulling people out ready for them to die throwing them in the jail because of their belief and then remember, Paul is heading down to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and he finds out everything that he had done was wrong. How do you think he felt? How do you think that moved Paul from that moment on? Well, I think he kind of get a clue here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at what he says here beginning in verse 9. He says, For I am the least of all the apostles. I am even unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But it's by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Do you get that? Paul said his motivation for his ministry from that moment on in Acts chapter 9 was motivated by grace. In fact, when we see him in Acts chapter 9, what happens immediately after he's baptized? He begins preaching that Jesus is the Christ. He begins moving right then at that moment in here. Paul says you can't follow God without getting this grace effect. In, in my translation, which I'm using the English standard, it says his grace toward me in verse 10 was not in vain. If you're reading, I think, out of the NIV or some of the more modern translations, it says his grace toward me was not without effect. God's grace does not come without the grace effect. And when you internalize God's grace, then things are going to be able to take place in your life. So what is it? Paul said, I am what I am because of it. Parents, are you here this morning and you're struggling with your kids and how to raise them? You're struggling with your teenager and, and sometimes you've got to fight with them just to get them to come to, to worship or to do things. We have husbands leaving wives and wives leaving husbands in our world and in our churches. What do we need? More teaching? Sure. Paul says, holy living, you better believe we should have holy living. But... If you don't teach them grace first, then you're not going to have the ammunition to fight Satan. 
You're not going to have the motivation to love one another like we should. You're not going to have the courage and the strength to be the people that God calls us to be. Because everything wraps up at Calvary, and that's where it all starts. And how we live is motivated or should be motivated by what happened at the cross. So what is it? What is this grace effect? Three quick things here this morning about grace that I think we need to have a a better understanding about. First one is simply this. Grace will humble you. Amen? Folks, let me tell you something. You cannot read Matthew's account or Luke's account or John's account or any of the accounts in the gospel of, of the crucifixion and not have it humble you. You cannot look back at Calvary and look back at what Jesus went through and his life and even why he came to this earth and not be humbled. That a man who does not know you, who lived many, many, many years before you and I ever were even thought of, was willing to die for you. Folks, if if that doesn't humble you in your life, nothing else will. And today, humility is in short supply. And we work so hard, especially in the church, and this is what I struggle with, we work so hard at being good. We work so hard at being right that we're left with two options. We either have to say the emperor has no clothes or we put on church clothes. Remember growing up, you had three types of clothes. You had your school clothes, you had your play clothes, and you had your church clothes. Hey, I remember it. My mom, we would go usually one year, and uh, it would be going to like J.C. Penney or something like that, and we're getting a suit, you know, and that's what you wore to church. And as soon as you were home from church, you better go hang that thing up because you better not mess up your church clothes. Now today, we're a little more, you know, casual. We can, we can dress down a little bit more. But folks, let me tell you something. Don't fool yourself. Whatever you're putting on on Sunday morning, a lot of us are still putting on church clothes. Why? Because I don't want you to see who I really am inside. Because I don't want you to see my junk. I don't want you to see my baggage that I'm carrying with you. Because you know what? For some odd reason, we get this feeling that when we walk inside a church building, we better make sure we have everything together. That when we walk with a fellow Christian boy, we better make sure that we have everything that looks right. Because if people knew who I really was on the inside, They may not like me. If people knew what really happened in my past, they may not want to have anything to do with me. So when grace is trying to get through, I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to get back down in there. This this, this smacks 2 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7 right into faith. Remember, Remember when Paul sits here and he says, we have this treasure, this light in these earthen vessels, these jars of clay. You know what jars of clay are good for? Breaking. My mom taught uh, public schools in Jacksonville, Florida for 25 years. And um, one of, this was while she was teaching, she had a student uh, make a big giant clay pot in pottery class. I don't know if they still have pottery classes nowadays, but back then they did. And so they, she, they, the student gave it to her, and she loved this thing. And you know how much teacher, if you have teachers in here, you understand what it's like at the end of the year, and you're cleaning up, and you're trying to get everything out. She knocked the pot off of her desk accidentally, and it just shattered on the floor. My mom loved that thing so much, you know what she did? She got down on her knees. She picked up every little piece that she could find down to the very little thing. She got a a bottle of super glue, and she glued that thing back together. I have it sitting on my desk now. And in that, you can still see the crack. You can still see the cracks that are there. You can still see kind of where there's some holes because some pieces are missing. And you know what? That's what our lives are like, a lot like. You see, because when we're born, we're in this perfect state with God, and we're in this perfect state with Him, but yet when we live, things happen. We make choices. Sometimes they're not by our choice. Sometimes we make dumb choices. And sometimes along the way, we are broken, we are falling apart, and then God's grace puts us back together, and guess what happens in those cracks? Guess what happens in those holes that are there? The light of Jesus shines forth and fills them. For the whole world to see, 
But yet we come together in church and what we do, we hide it because we want to lie about our messes. We want to cover our messes. We want to dye our messes. We don't want people to know who we truly are because we struggle against the reality of walking in here and saying, my family's really messed up and we so desperately need the grace of God. Let me put it this way. What's it like in your house? Mm, Let's take a while, I guess. 38 minutes before you're supposed to be here. (laughs) You already got some laughing. Get out of that bathroom. We have got to go. We are running behind. I've got to teach Bible class. I've got to be there because I've got to count. I've got to do the Lord's Supper. Come on, we've got to get out of that building. And then you get mom and you get, and you get dad are getting in the car, brother and sister in the car. They're coming down the highway here trying to get to church and, and sister screaming at brother and brother scre- screaming at sister. And dad's turning, y'all better hush up. And then you whip it here to the parking lot at Beltline on two wheels and you slide into the parking lot and you get out. Brother Bob, how are you doing today? Come on, children, let's go praise the Lord together. Now you tell me we don't still have church clothes on. Because we struggle against this reality. Because we don't want people to see who we truly are. And it should break our hearts at what we can do to others when we try to pretend we don't need God's grace when humility isn't there. That maybe... Maybe our life's a mess a little bit. Folks, if there are no messy people in this congregation, then where are they? I'll tell you, you have two options. They are either in heaven or denial, one of the two. Because life is full of messes. Life is full of challenges. And we are so used to be covering our messes that that we're afraid and we can fake some people out. Paul says here in the passage, I don't even deserve to be an apostle. I don't even deserve to be here. Ooh, I'm a mess. Ooh, I don't like that too much. Folks, Jesus was drawn to messes. I heard a preacher say this one time, and it's really stuck with me. Maybe that's why we call him the Messiah, because Jesus was drawn and came to save the messes. We walk through this door and we say, I ain't got no mess. Give me a break. Yes, we do. All of us have these challenges. This could be dangerous. Turn to the person next to you and say you're a mess, and I know it. (laughs) <laughs> Some of those wives just looked at those husbands and say, you better not if you won't lunch today. <laughs> Hinton, <laughs> Hinton's got like everybody up here telling him. That could be scary. We'll talk afterwards here. But seriously, how would our communities change? I don't care if you're here in Decatur. I don't care if it's in North Alabama, if it's in Montgomery, or if it's in New York City. How would our communities change? How would our churches change if outside we had a sign painted out here and said, we're a mess, but God is working on it, and we have a Messiah come on in and check us out? I wonder if it would change. See, grace humbles us. And until we are able to stand up and say that we're a mess that God is working on, but I'm saved by grace and not by my performance, we will never be able to love each other like we should. Folks, don't misunderstand me. Yes, faith comes in there. Faith is a part. But our faith is our reaction to God's grace. What we do and how we live is a direct motivation, a direct relation to what we feel about what God did at Calvary. And folks, we need to understand, and when I finally understand that I'm not going to heaven based on my performance, when I stand before God, God's not going to sit here, whoa, John, you work at Faulkner University. Enter ye in. But I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. By the grace that God gave. Now my faith has to move me. That's how I'm getting to heaven. Grace humbles us. Not only that, grace, second thing, grace makes me holy. See, grace doesn't give me a license to sin. Grace doesn't give me the freedom to do what I want to do. On just drastically, on the other hand, on the other hand, it drives me to make choices that I wouldn't have otherwise. 
Boy, this world has thrown holiness to the wind. Look at your television. Look at your politicians. Look at uh, the, the movie stars and, and the sports stars and anything else that you want to see on TV. We have a new law of relativity in our world. You know what the law is? Do what you want. There is no law. When I was uh, a young youth minister back in the day, um, you know, as many young youth ministers starting out, money is tight. And uh, we had one car that, well, the fan motor quit working on it. You know, the little fan motor to cool your engine. But I learned as long as you kept driving, it's good. It's going to be fine. If you get stopped at the stoplight, you know, you're not, not going to stay there long enough. As long as you're moving, that engine's going to stay cool. And I learned this also. Somebody gave me a trick that said if it ever starts heating up, you can turn the heat on, and it drives, it pulls the heat off your engine. I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool, especially in the wintertime, perfect. Well, I was living in North Georgia, and I was working on my master's degree back at Faulkner, and I had to drive it's about a three-hour drive between uh, North Georgia and coming to Montgomery, and so I always had to go through Atlanta. And I would always have, to, always have to come down about twice a year to work on some classes, or twice a semester to work on classes. And, and uh, this was one summer. I was taking a class, and I always tried to plan it. They would let us out at noon, and I always tried to plan because you know what happens in Atlanta. Traffic. It really doesn't matter which time unless it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and then there's really no traffic. Um, so I was trying to plan it so I could scoot through as quick as I possibly could to get home. And, you know, there's a reason why they call it Hot Atlanta for a reason. It gets hot. And I'm sitting here driving back through Atlanta, and it's one of those days. And I left late, leaving Montgomery late, so I knew I was going to hit traffic. And so I was trying to cheat my way around and try to figure a way to get around the city as quick as I could. And I hit one of those traffic jams that was one of those bad traffic jams where you go about a mile an hour. You're wondering if you're ever going to get out of the city. And it's one of those days where the temperature is probably 95, 96 degrees, and it feels like it's 125 outside because humidity is going, and it's just the worst possible thing. And I'm sitting here in the middle of traffic, and guess what happens? That little temperature gauge starts going up. And I'm sitting here thinking, this isn't good. And so I'm sitting here, and we're waiting even more, and that temperature gauge is going up, so I'm turning the air conditioning off. I am rolling the windows down. I'm trying to find whatever I can to keep cool, and that temperature gauge keeps going up. So what do I do? I turn that heat on. That's really smart, I know. It's brilliant. So I turn that heat on, trying to pull off the heat off the engine, and I look up, and there's a van in front of me, you know, one of those kind of hippie vans from the 60s, Volkswagen vans. And on the back of it was every ugly bumper sticker you could think of on the back window. It had a one bumper sticker I remember seeing. It said, if it feels good, do it twice. And right there in the middle, there was a bumper sticker that said, God is dead, get over it. So here am I, this working on my master's, had this great week of studying the Bible and these different things, and I'm just furious. And I mean, I'm probably close to heat stroke anyway, since I'm sitting here in a car in the middle of, of the summer in Atlanta with the heat on. I, I'm dying anyway, so I'm about doing it. So I did any reasonable thing any reasonable Christian would do. I rammed him. Twice. He got out and he said, what'd you do that for? I said, it felt good. It took off. No. <laughs> no, I didn't do it. But I wanted to. I was thinking about it. But here's the thing. <coughs> here's the thing. Because God is grace, that man is breathing. Because God is gracious, he has another heartbeat. Because God is patient, he is still alive. Because me, if I'm God, and I look down and it says God is dead, I'm like, no, I'm not, but you are. You see, but here's the thing. When God's grace starts grappling with me, grace says, John, you can't smack that guy. You can't run into him. You can't do those things. When God's grace gets a hold of you, when you've got a brother that you disagree with, you can't speak bad about him. 
When you disagree with a sister across on the other side of the church, you can't say those offensive words about them. Why? Because God has been so good to you for you to behave in that way. That's Romans 6. Do we go on living our lives like we did in our former past? Paul says, no, God forbid that we even do that. It's not a license because we got God's grace to go on and do what we want to do and live how we want to live because God's grace is going to cover us. No, God's grace because of the blood that was shed should encourage us to say, no, I'm not going to live like that. Because it's those actions that put Jesus on the cross in the first place. It's not duty that drives me to do good. It's how good God has been to me. Jesus loves me this much. How dare I do anything else? Remember John 14, 15, if you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. It's not about duty and guilt and fear. You see, because here's the thing. A eh, little side note here. I promise I'm making it quick. When we make Christianity just a bunch of do's and do nots, what have we done? We just made an Old Testament law with the New Testament. That's all we've done. That's all the Old Testament law was. Here's how you live. Thou shalt not remember all the Ten Commandments and all these things that are in here. When we make Christianity just a list of checklist of, okay, I went to church here. Oh, I didn't cuss here. Oh, I didn't drink this here. Or I didn't do this here. When we make Christianity like that, a, nothing but a checklist, all we've done is made a new Old Testament law. Now, should we come to worship? Absolutely. But we don't do it because we're checking off a box. We do it because we're motivated because of what Jesus did at Calvary and what God has done for us. Why do I not go around and sleep with everybody I can find? Why? Because God calls me to live a holier life. Because he says, this, is, this relationship is between a husband and a wife. Why do I not go and say those words? Because God has encouraged me to not speak those things, but to speak words of grace seasoned with salt. And that's what challenges me to do these things. When you come in here on Sunday morning, what's it like? Are you sitting there saying, come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. We've got things to do. What is it that you like to whine and gripe about? Now, hear me, church. That's how we're worshiping God. It may not be motivated by grace. But praise God, Jesus cleaned your soul he's laid a feast before us and he's blessed us and he's given us freely freely salvation and so we rush together to come and worship we rush together and we come to serve we rush together and we come to fellowship with each other and holiness doesn't come from a performance but it comes from God and what we do springs forth from our love you see because what it does for us not only is grace make us Holy, not only does it humble us, but grace will make us do the hard work. Paul says here in this passage, he worked harder than all the other apostles. But it wasn't him, it was the grace of God. Now, I understand that when I'm sitting up here and I'm saying about hard work, hard work means different things to different people. But church, it's time for you and me to do a little bit of hard work. Got a confession to make since I don't know a lot of you and it's okay to make these confessions on this day. There are times when I would rather deal with a bunch of whining second, second graders during VBS than to deal with a lot of my brothers and sisters in the church at times. But hard work says you got to. Hard work says you got to be together. My mom used to tell me, John, be nice. Well... Time for being nice is over. It's time for the church to stand up and be family. Jesus said in John chapter 3 that we are born of the water and of the Spirit. Nice is easy. Family is hard work. Because family is about loving. Family is about making sacrifices. Family is about compromising and, making compa and having compassion with each other. Being family is about forgiving people even when there are times when we don't want to. And family's about admitting when we're wrong, when we need to make some things change in our lives. It's not saying I'm done with you. It's looking over and saying, you're my brother, you're my sister. I can't throw you away. We've got to work together, even though you frustrate the fire out of me, but I still love you because you are part of the family of God. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul gives that whole little section in there that we're all part of the family and, and we're all part of this body and we all have different sections. But he says here in verse 26, we weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice because that's what being part of the family of God is all about. Is it easy to be nice? Sure it is. It's not what Jesus prayed for. Jesus never prayed. Father, I pray that they're nice to each other. No, he said, Father, I pray that they're one just as you and I are one. Sometimes being one is hard. Sometimes being one is tough. The truth of it is, there are some of us that probably need to do some hard work. There are some of you here that probably need to do some hard work as far as even... You've heard so many sermons. You've heard invitation after invitation after invitation about making the decision to follow God, to allow your faith, faith to move you to grab that grace, to repent, to confess Jesus as Lord, to get in water and be immersed in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Some of you need to do that hard work this morning by stepping out. But I would say probably for the majority of the people that are here, There may be some of you that need to do some hard work by uh, going across the auditorium this morning. And that brother or that sister that you haven't talked to in 10 years because you had an argument one day in the, in the foyer. You still come to church together, but you can't stand each other. There may be somebody in here that need to do that this morning. There may be some husbands or some wives that need to look over at their spouse this morning and say, you know what, I need to do some hard work. I haven't been the husband or the wife that I need to be. And I'm sorry. And I made a promise to love you all the days of my life. And I made that promise before a group of people, but most importantly, I made it before God. And there may be some of you here that need to do the hard work of stepping out in this pew and stepping into the road this morning, but you're afraid. You're afraid because you're sitting here with a group of people and you wonder what they're going to say about you. You're worried and you're scared. What are they going to talk about me? Oh, I know. I've sat, sat in the back of, of church buildings and somebody comes forward. What automatically happens? time they went forward they need Jesus let me tell you something close your ears off to that. do the hard work and I don't know you but I'll meet you down the aisle and your elders and will come and pray for you because none of us in here are perfect and we all have broken pieces that God has put back together and it's only because of the grace of God we're even here this morning. So are you ready to do the hard work? If we can help you, will you come as we together stand and as we sing? Amazing.